Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have we have Troy Lambert. Yes, we do. And it was great. And I got to meet Troy at the 20 Books to 50K Vegas conference. And he is a great guy. Yeah. So this is a really good interview. We talk mm-hmm. about, he, he interviews authors for Plotter. Mm-hmm. So we talked about, and that's a um, kind of an outlining software that you can mm-hmm. use to plan your novel. And people use right. it for all kinds of different things that I didn't right. realize. But um, so he's talked to a lot of authors and we talked to him about, you know, what he's learned, talking to these different authors. He's um, he's a hybrid author. He does mm-hmm. his own books and then he does some of the publisher. So yep. we talked about that. Yep. And so, yeah. Oh, and he had some really good kind of out of the box ideas on how to get your books into bookstores. Yes. Kind of, yes. Do you remember that it was kind of like mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. your normal, mm-hmm. uh, this is how you do it. So it was really yeah. good. It was very it interesting. It was a great interview. Yeah. It, he's a very interesting guy. So what's yeah. been going on with you this week? Well, this week has been really quiet because Mm -hmm. um, my husband was out of town. I had no appointments. I had no podcast interviews. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote and I wrote more than I have like in weeks. It was great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I'm feeling good good about that. And I did it kind of different this week. Normally I'm Mm -hmm. trying to, I used to just write a book. And then when I got finished with the book, I would do, I would kind of let the admin pile up and I would do that Mm -hmm. when I got done. And I just can't do that anymore. I just have too many things going. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is just the translations have a lot of stuff. So I tried this week. I thought I'm just not going to answer my email until Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to write. And so I wrote Monday through Thursday and then Friday Mm -hmm. I answered email. And what I noticed was that because I didn't reply to people, Mm-hmm. you know, they didn't reply to me, which creates more work. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. if you have a question, they answer the question, you have a reply back. So it was yeah. really nice because it, right. it, it kind of bothers me to have those emails waiting for me to be mm-hmm. answered. But I think I'm just going to put them in a folder Badge and them. answer them. Yeah. Like towards the end of the week, I think mm-hmm. that'll be easier. That's great. So, yeah. And I bought a humongous yoga ball to sit on while oh, I'm good. writing. That's <laughs> I great. love it. Good for the core. <laughs> good yeah, for the core. It also took me like 45 minutes to inflate it. So it's huge. I'll post a picture of it in the group. It's amazing. <laughs> and then, um, so how are the translations going? Oh, they're going good. The French one is up, book one. Yes. Uh-huh. And now I have a plan. I'm going to uh, do book two, mm-hmm. like a month after. And book mm-hmm. three mm-hmm. will be in 2022, probably oh, good. in March. Mm-hmm. So I'll kind of space those out. And then I decided on the German translations that I need to put a um, the series name mm-hmm. on the cover. And I we tweaked that. And so that had to be changed. So I'm okay. just waiting for the covers on that. And then those will come out probably starting in December. Great. So, yeah. That's fantastic. And yeah. then you were interviewed for Plotter, weren't you? Yes, that's right. So I will put yeah. a link to that in the show notes because... Yeah. Uh, Troy interviewed me because I have a um, that I have the how to outline a cozy book mm-hmm. in course, and mm-hmm. they asked if I would like to create a plotter outline for mm-hmm. people who are doing cozy. So I did that. So that's in plotter, and you can find that in their templates section. But he interviewed me about that and about writing cozies, and mm-hmm. so that's on YouTube, and I'll link to that. Oh, that's great. You had a lot going on this week. I right? have, I have, <laughs> and I haven't. Um, I went to the 20 books, Vegas, 20 books, 50 K Vegas conference um, in Vegas. And yeah. I left on Monday and I came back yesterday, which was Friday. Uh, it was great. It was great to see people y'all. <laughs> it was so awesome. And for those of you that were there and came up to me and thanked us for the podcast and said how much you love the podcast, thank you so much. I called Sarah and said, you should be here to hear how much people really are loving the podcast. It just did my heart so good. And I just appreciate y'all so much for doing that. Um, yeah. And my, I did a panel on advanced reader copies mm-hmm. and I did a, a talk on uh, what I wish I'd known about indie publishing. 
And the, all, both of those are up on YouTube now. So we'll put those links in the show notes so you can see those if you'd like, if you didn't get to go. Um, but yeah, it was great to see people and just talk. I went to um, a couple of really good sessions. I went to Nick Becker's uh, session on kind of moving target marketing, and he had some really good ideas. And uh, so if you, all of the sessions are up on YouTube or the, they will be. So look mm-hmm. for that one. It was really good. And then both of Becca Symes, um sessions were just, you know, again, so yeah. great. And went to Claire Taylor's on, um, you know, part of her story alignment thing. Mm-hmm. And wow. It was really great. And awesome. yeah, so it was fun. We, I saw our friends, Mike and Oliver. Hi guys. We want to <laughs> have you on the podcast. They have this really great tool for building a website and it's kind of an all in one. Oh, nice. They have everything set up. All you do is kind of go plug on and play thing. Yeah. Kind of plug and play. And then you can upload your Amazon links and anything that ever changes with your books, it automatically changes mm. in the, on the website. Yeah. It's awesome. so cool. That's like a dream. Such a great true. idea. <laughs> so it's in beta right now. I think it's launching in January and we're going to have them on. Cool. In January, so that we can um, get them, you know, so you guys can find out about it because it's really such an, a cool tool. I mean, they had on the vendor day, they had just lines and lines <laughs> of people because it was so cool and such a neat idea, you know. And uh-huh. um, well, yeah, that's needed because yeah, little changes that pile up over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't you tell down. you how many times I've said. You know, on my website, like a month after the book came out, it still says pre-order now. Like Mm -hmm. I forgot to go in and change it Mm -hmm. because I just don't think about that. It's just, you know, the small things. Yeah. And like if you run a sale or anything, it will automatically change. So it's pulling the data from the Mm -hmm. the vendor websites. And so right now it's just Amazon, you know, the Amazon links, but they're going to try to get all the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, what else? Yeah, it was just super fun to see everybody. So Ricardo from Weezy and Dan Wood and um, Mar- Mark uh, Lefebvre and just, you know, all, got to all our club everybody. House, yeah, all the Clubhouse author friends that I've met while I was on Clubhouse. And this yeah, great. this is like the first author mm-hmm. event. This is the first big since, author event, really, yeah. since COVID. So. Yeah, since COVID. So yeah. it so was you seem rejuvenated. You seem. I am. I was happy, and uh, I mean, I was exhausted. Yeah. Um, I went to bed <laughs> really early <laughs> most nights, and um, which was a little embarrassing. And um, then, like on Wednesday night, I had been given a ticket to go see Magic Mike, mm-hmm. and I gave it away because I I spoke. I was supposed to well, I did speak. I spoke at 8.15 Thursday morning <laughs> and the smoke and just the dry air was yeah. really kind of scratching my throat pretty bad. Of course, I miss Channing, Ta- Channing, Tating, Channing Tatum. <laughs> wow. Uh, he was there. He danced. At oh, wow. Yep. So, but that's okay. I mean, yeah. you know, I had a responsibility. So, but, <laughs> so you fulfilled your obligation. And then I fulfilled my obligation, bit. but I missed Channing Tatum, but uh, yeah. that's okay. Um, yeah, it was just super fun. Just yeah, I'm super so fun. glad you got to go and see everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was good. really, really happy. And uh, yeah. they had a big signing yesterday, which I didn't do. Um, I just kind of, at the time when it was time to sign up for that, I'd never really done a signing. And, you know, mm-hmm. I've since done a signing. And mm-hmm. I do wish I had stayed and done it. But by the time I realized that it was too, too late to do yeah. it. So, yeah. um, but it's hard shipping books and stuff. So I don't yeah. know. I don't Especially know. now mm-hmm. because of the supply yeah. chain issues. Yeah. So it really, yeah, is, I think but... you have to really plan ahead if mm-hmm. you're doing that. So, yeah. Good. So it was great. Yeah. yeah. So well, do we have great. a question of the week? Um, mm-hmm. well, actually <laughs> you had something else you were going to talk about because, uh, the, Oh yes. I forgot. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I, that, podcast that I talked about um oh I don't know a few weeks ago that I was interviewed for not your average lives it is Mm -hmm. now it came out this week and um it was it was a fun interview really fun Mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily about books but just kind of about you know how you do things later 
when you start something new later in life and if you're in that boat and you want to listen to it, um, you should yeah, we'll listen to that, that one and here. others yeah. of hers because they're really yeah. great. Yeah. So I was going to ask real quick before we do the mm-hmm. question of the week, yeah. did anybody talk about um, Spotify and find away voices at the conference? Did you hear about that? No. Okay. So I only read it last night or the night before um, Lindsay broker linked to an article on Twitter mm-hmm. and uh, Spotify has acquired find away voices. What? Which is- which is huge news, right? <laughs> yes. And so apparently the article said, I'll, I'll see if I can find that and link to the, in the show notes, but apparently they're going to keep all the people on find away uh-huh. and just let that run, you know, uh-huh. as like a, so mm-hmm. like a little self-contained unit within Spotify, mm-hmm. but obviously they're trying to bring audiobooks to Spotify. So that's huge, huge news. And we're, we actually have an interview lined up with Will Degas. Yes, we uh, do. Come in a couple of weeks. So we will yeah. be asking about that. So I'd wondered if the word was out when you were there, mm-hmm. if you heard anything. No, I didn't hear anything mm-hmm. like that. Okay. So that would have been big news for sure. Yeah. For sure. So I'm not sure what that will mean. It may mean nothing for a little while because mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. those things take yeah, a while. Yeah, it takes a while. Yeah. yeah. But uh, um, yeah, that, very- that could be huge for yeah. getting our audiobooks into a new ecosystem yes yeah wow how cool yeah so i don't oh, know good how they'll for do them, it though, though. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah mean, that's so cool for will and them yeah. um i also took some video of the strip and the bellagio because you know my first book is running from yes. a rock star and it's a Perfect. wake up married in vegas book and mm-hmm. so i'm going to use that footage and do something on TikTok with it. So oh, when I be when I figure out what I'm going to do and get it edited and stuff, I'll I'll let y'all know. So I'll link to it so y'all can see what I what I did. But yeah, it, it's awesome. just it was just so great. I mean, I, it was great. It was great, y'all. <laughs> just great. But it really was fun. And it was funny because people would come up and say, I heard your voice. And I was looking for you in the room. So oh, that was, they knew they recognized they your knew voice. my voice yeah. from the podcast. Yeah. That's funny. Or Clubhouse, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe so. our question should be something about conferences. Yeah. Like um, how to make, how do you. Uh, have you been to a conference? Yeah. And if and you what, do, maybe have. Yeah. What are you well, looking which, forward to? Yeah. Most, or which ones do you one. recommend? Yeah. Like what have you, which conferences have you enjoyed? Yes. Let's do that one. Yeah. yeah so. What do you do when you go to enjoy them? Like, mm-hmm. do you connect before or, mm-hmm. you know, what are your conference tips yeah. and which ones would you attend? Would yeah. you recommend? That's great. Those are good. Okay. Ones. That's cool. a good one. Yeah. Very good. Well, we should get on with the interview. Yes. All right. So here's Troy. Well, today we are super excited to have Troy Lambert with us. Hi, Troy. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you guys? We're great. We're so happy you're here. Yes. We're going to pick your brain about plotter and lots of other things too. So, yeah. yeah. So let me read your bio and then we'll jump right into the questions. You bet. All right. Troy Lambert is an author, editor, and freelance writer. He is also the education lead for Plotter, a visual outlying software for writers. He's published over 25 novels, written over 30, and edited dozens of full-length manuscripts and loves to help other writers avoid mistakes he made as an inspiring author. He's a member of NINC, the Idaho Writers Guild, and an associate member of the International Thriller Writers and a bunch of other groups as well. He lives, works, and plays in Boise, Idaho with his wife and two talented dogs who are often enlisted to do craft blog posts. <laughs> Excellent use of dogs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so tell us, Tori, how did you get into writing? Uh, so that's actually a, a, a story for my autobiography, but I, I wanted to be a writer when I from the time I was a little kid. Yeah. Um, so I wrote my first book when I was six it's wow. called George and the giant castle. It'll never be published. It was awful, but I had no <laughs> idea because I was six. Right. So I decided that if I ever get around to writing my autobiography, it's going to be called Troy and the giant castle. Um, because when I was a teenager, I knew for sure I would tell my school counselors, everybody that would listen that I wanted to be a writer. Right. Um, and they all the experts told me that I couldn't do that. Yeah, that there was no way I could make a living at it. That that was a nice dream, um, and that I was a very talented writer and a good storyteller, but that I could never make it. And so I needed to find something else to do with my life. So I listen to them, and I tell people after a few decades of hairnets and name tags and various careers, I decided that otherwise, other than being a writer, I was pretty much unemployable. 
Mm. So I needed to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I did. Um, and fortunately for me, that was good timing. It was kind of when self-publishing started to emerge as a real thing, um, as a real alternative. And there were a lot of small presses coming out. It, it was just a great, it, it was, my timing was really good because I was a better writer by that point mm-hmm. and the opportunities were greater. Oh, that's great. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most right, most of the people we have on here say that, that they wanted to be a writer since they were a kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of them do have that first book that they wrote when they were children. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Your title was great. I love the title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did well at titles, but even back then. Yeah. Even back then. Well, tell us, what is your definition of success? Oh boy. So my definition of success, I guess, has, has changed over the years. Uh Um, For me, a part of it is making a living as a writer. Yeah. And, and that means a lot of different things. Um, And so when people tell me they define success that way, I say, well, first of all, we need to define make a living. Mm -hmm. Because if Mm -hmm. you think that you're going to live in the suburbs with a huge house, five bedrooms, three bath, a couple of Mercedes in the driveway, we might need to have a reality check at least for a little while, you know, until you hit a certain level. So, but my definition of success really is to reach readers and other writers at this point, I've kind of transitioned to doing a lot of writer education. And a part of that is, and I also like to educate educators because I, I don't want other people to tell people they can't do this Mm -hmm. because it caused damage in my life. And to those people that were around me as well, because a creative person who is not creating is a time bomb that's ticking. Mm -hmm. You're going to do creative things. They're not going to be productive and good creative things. It's going to hurt you. It's going to poison your mind. It's going to affect your mental health, all those different things. So my definition of success is more about reaching readers and reaching other writers, but to do what I discovered was that to do that, that means they have to buy your work, which means you make money. So the success and the writing for a living part comes with that, mm. whether that's really your goal or not. Right. Right. Um, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, I think that's really true that you need to think about like what type of lifestyle you want and where mm-hmm. you live. And maybe if you live in a really expensive area, if you're trying to make a living with your writing, it might be smarter to move somewhere where the cost of living is cheaper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so true about the um, educators not understanding that you can make a living mm-hmm. doing this. I mean, it's, I think there's so many people that don't understand self publishing and they don't understand the options. People, I went to an event and somebody, one of my family members asked me the other day, So, this writing thing, you do okay with that? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna first, but it's going pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people just don't know. Mm-mm. Yeah, I they actually. Don't. So when I went and saw my brother a couple of weeks ago, um, <laughs> I I interacted with a lot of my family members, and it was actually really amusing because a lot of them just don't ask. Yeah, like they don't even ask about how things are going, Mm-mm. what you're doing. And one of my uncles finally kind of asked me, and I said, "Yeah, I have about, about 25 books out or so." And I'm like, "Novels?" I said, "I have a bunch of shorter works, and I have a bunch more stuff coming out next year." And he was like, "You had?" He goes, "I remember reading your first book a long time ago." And I go, "Oh yeah, I remember that book too." <laughs> like, I don't want to. Let's can we move on to talk about another topic? Can I but, get you a new book? Yeah. Yeah. They they for the most part they don't even ask. It's funny. It's like a really awkward thing that they're like, "Oh, you're making a living as a writer," and they kind of dance around it like maybe this is a tender subject. And I'm like, "It's yeah. not really." No. You know, it's it's, you can do this, but we need to inspire people to the fact that you can do this. And I wish I could sometimes take educators to big writers conferences that I go Mm -hmm. to and just introduce them to people. Mm -hmm. See this guy? He makes about three times what you do teaching school by writing books. But you can tell your students that they can't make it if you want. Right. Right. There's just an alternative. That's the thing. I mean, there are authors who have gotten rich, published authors who have gotten rich writing um, fiction or even mm-hmm. nonfiction, but fiction mostly. And I make a living writing my books. However, 
I'm not rich. I just make a living. I mean, you know, I know how much I need to make. My husband knows how much he needs to make. We make that and, and we make a living, you know, and I get to do what I want to do. And I think that there is, even in the writer community, there's a little bit of misconception. When you say you make a living, you're saying you're. That you're rich. Right. That's not it. You're making a living, you know? And so I think that that's important to think about too. You know, and um, Mm -hmm. but definitely with educators, I think that, you know, because what they think about is that big contract, you know, like the James Patterson's and the right, you know, or the the big literary fiction contracts or whatever. They think success is rare. And I'm like the majority of us that make a living writing, Mm -hmm. for the most part, nobody knows who we we are. are. Yeah, outside we're not of a, names. We're, yeah. we're, I tell people I'm well known in a very limited circle of people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it's enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's enough people right. that I, I get to do really cool things. I get to speak at conferences. I get to interview writers. I get to do all this really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. But as far as, you know, if I walk down the street, does somebody recognize me and stop me for an autograph? No, no. <laughs> and I don't necessarily even want that. I mean, it might be kind of nice because then instead of walking, I'd be riding in a, I don't know, super nice car or something. I don't know what yeah, you'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's so that definition of success, I think, is really important. And mm-hmm. also the definition of what it means to make a living mm-hmm. because people just get the wrong impression. You're absolutely right. They think because you can, um, you know, drop a hundred bucks on something that you're you're rich because a lot of writers don't make that much money, Uh you know, and they really struggle. And I'm like, I understand that, but you know, making a living doesn't mean that I'm just rolling in it over here and I can do whatever I want. Uh -uh. And, and, you know, when I first started, well, I was fortunate enough that my first book did make money. And then the second book made a little bit more. And then that's when I transitioned to full-time writing. But what we did that entire first year was, get into a better financial situation. We paid off debt. We got, we got Mm -hmm. um, things, you know, at a more, you know, we sort of downsized a little bit in other ways so that when I did transition, I was able to do it without a lot of stress because we had gotten rid of a lot of things that cause stress, you know? And Mm -hmm. so I think you have to think about that when you, um, are trying to make that decision about going full-time or, or, you know, being a full-time author. So. Yeah, absolutely. You need to be, and, and I don't, I tell people, if you wait for the perfect time, you'll actually never do it. Correct. Cause it's never yeah. going to be the perfect time. Mm-hmm. However, there are things you can do to set yourself up and realize that you're not going to be going out for a hundred dollar steak dinners on a regular basis. No. Um, unless you're willing to work for the man. And if, mm-hmm. if that's what you want to do, that's okay. Because the other thing that I've learned is that not everyone should write for a living. Some mm-hmm. people should just leave it as a side gig or as a hobby mm-hmm. because it's actually a job. Mm-hmm. It's work. And so some of the things that you enjoy doing, there are going to be days when you don't enjoy doing them, but you have to do them anyway. Mm-hmm. And then there are going to be other things that you may not enjoy doing. But you have to do them anyway, because you're dependent upon this for your income. Right. So, you know, keeping up with changes, all that kind of stuff, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You may not like it. You don't want to read that long blog about what's happening with Facebook ads. But guess what? You better. Mm -hmm. You better. You need to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So uh, tell us what you wish you'd known about writing and craft. Oh, my goodness. Well, so probably my most naive thing in my 20s, probably, and when I was in college, was that I thought I was a good writer. <laughs> Don't is, we all? <laughs> so I tell this story about, you know, I was in a, a an honors English class at Arizona State University with Phil Mickelson. Okay? Oh, wow. He was the nerd on the golf team. I was the nerd in the corner writing sci-fi novels, which you know, I don't write sci-fi novels now, if you, <laughs> if you look at my <laughs> thing. But I wrote a bunch of stuff, and some of my stories were okay, and they were all right. But I look back at it now, and I'm like, thank goodness nobody picked up those novels, because then people would be able to read them, yes. because they were terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wish I had realized, which is what I realize now, that I'm never going to master this thing. 
I'm never, I, there's always somebody that's better, already somebody, always some way to improve. Mm-hmm. There's never a point when you get to where you're just like, okay, I've got it. I'm down. I'm, I'm done. I had a friend of mine once tell me, I don't go to writers conferences because I don't learn anything anymore. Mm-hmm. And I went, wow. Yeah. Let me know how you got there. <laughs> Cause I don't know what that's like. Yeah. And this is someone who's published, you know, one or two books compared to somebody who's published a whole bunch of books, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm like, so I wish I had known how much I had to learn and also mm-hmm. how much the craft evolves by what reader expectations are things we could have written 20 years ago and published with a big publishing house. We can't even get anybody to look at now, even as a self-published author, mm-hmm. because readers have different expectations. And if you're going to do this for a living and not as a hobby on the site or whatever, you can't write um, a thriller. That's the length of the new Testament. Most right. people aren't going to read that. You know, They right. want something short, fast, you know, and fast paced and action. Our attention span is just shorter. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I think that that's hard for a lot of people because, you know, it's this, you know, the beginning writers, because it's this opus that they have worked their lives on and, you know, uh, they poured everything into it. And um, yeah, you got to trim. You, yeah. gotta, you just have to trim because big, big works. Now I know in romance right now, there is a trend that is, you know, there are romance books over a hundred thousand words. I mm-hmm. personally have a hard time reading that. Like I'll read a fantasy book over a hundred thousand words, but a romance book over a hundred thousand words is tough for me. And so um, I kind of think you have to know your genre too, you know, a, mm-hmm. a, a fantasy book over a hundred thousand words will work a thriller over a hundred thousand words. Sometimes not so much a romance, yeah. not so much because it's pacing and you want people to get through it and get to the next book. Basically. Well, yeah. I mean, the biggest thing about thrillers and stuff that long, and even romances, is carrying the story, carrying what's relatively a simple story usually yeah. with romance, mm-hmm. um, a hero's journey, whatever it is, mm-hmm. or, or the typical romance plot, you know, meet cute, get separated, come back together, fall in yeah. love happily ever after, right? That's a real simplification of the whole thing. Right. But if you think about how simple that story structure is to carry that on for over a hundred thousand words is kind of challenging to keep your reader engaged Correct. through all that middle part, you know, Correct. with a fantasy, I expect to come to it and have to memorize the names of 50 right. different characters <laughs> 30 of them are going to die in the first half of the book. And we're going to introduce right. 15 more. Yeah. And then there's going to be several storylines and they'll all wrap up hopefully at the end of the book and it'll be good. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. what I expect from a fantasy. I don't expect that from a romance, unless you've got some kind of uh, harem, multiple romance storylines. I don't right, know if people right, even right. write that, but I, I don't yes, read it do. usually. So, you know, yes, I don't know. It's <laughs> called yeah. reverse harem and it's yeah. super oh, successful. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, I agree. And like in a fantasy, you sort of expect the middle slog. Like it's part of the jer- the journey. The journey. You, 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 if you're a Rome, if you're a fantasy fan, that you like that part. So you know, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that people need to just come into writing with realistic expectations and and know know the genre expectations. I say that all the time. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? Man, I'd wish I'd known how hard marketing was. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I wish I'd known and I wish more people understood is that just because you have a publisher doesn't mean you don't have to do marketing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Usually when you have a publisher, so I tell a lot of our authors what it is, is I as a publisher can market your book to a certain extent, but people know why I'm showing up at the bookstore if I'm a publisher. Even yeah. my local bookstore, they're like, Oh, you got some books to show us. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you're the author, you're the one that has the passion about the book. And for the most part, as a publisher and even our, with our marketing people and stuff like that, what they do is they set up tasks for you to do. Here's a blog tour. Go do it. Here's a book signing. Go to it and sign books. We're giving you work to do. And there's work that you can do yourself that we can't do. There's people you can outreach that will listen to the author that won't listen to a publisher. So it's the same thing as an author. I'm like, when you walk into a bookstore, you need to have a plan, right? And a lot of people Mm -hmm. don't have a plan. They're like, they just walk in the bookstore and go, hey, do you want to carry my book? And I'm like, (laughs) that doesn't work because first of all, you might be talking to the wrong person. Second of all, you know, I mean, so 
there's all these different ins and outs of marketing that it's just really hard to do. It's hard to master and it's always changing. I mean, we see now with the, you know, Apple privacy things, the changes at Facebook, stuff like that, that our audiences that we were targeting, we may not be able to target as much anymore. Uh, we can't know if people are actually opening our emails as much yeah. anymore because now right. there's a privacy level there. And so email companies, email providers are struggling to find out a solution for this. You know, Facebook is finding, trying to find a solution. Google is trying to prepare for a cookie-less future where there won't be cookies on websites and we won't be able to track those things. And, you know, as people, I'm like, I love that because I love my privacy is protected as a marketer. I'm like, I hate that because I want to know everything about you so I can target just the people that I want. Right. Right. So it's kind of a dilemma. So I wish I knew how complex marketing was Mm -hmm. and how much time it took. Right. It's a very time consuming part of your, if you're going to write for a living, Mm -hmm. it's a very time consuming part of your business. Right. Yeah. Well, we can't move on without you telling us what is the plan if we work walk into a bookstore. Like, what should we, what what should we say to? So, what I usually tell people is, I say you should have two or three copies of your book with you that you plan to give away. Oh, okay. And the first thing you do, depending on how big the bookstore is, I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. if you're walking into a small indie bookstore, you're going to get, you know, hopefully, right to the person that you need to talk to. But right. um, Barnes and Noble or something like that, you ask who's in charge of purchasing. Be mm-hmm. sure your books are available for them to purchase somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, if you Good just point. published through Create Space on Amazon and selected expanded distribution and used a Create Space ISBN, good luck mm-hmm. getting most independent yeah. bookstores. They will not have a, a box that comes into their store that has the Amazon logo on the side. Yeah. If you take your books to an event there, please don't take them in an Amazon box. Mm-hmm. You're just gonna. That's just a good way to get yourself ousted and independent bookstores talk to each other so anyway that so that never works out but i ask who's in charge of purchasing Mm -hmm. and i just talk to that person i say here here's a copy of my book i'm going to give it to you sign it whatever you want here you go um take my book read it let me know before you to let me know what you think i put a business card in there it's got my email on it all that kind of stuff and i say here's the isbn it's available through you know, your normal things. Sometimes I'll take a one sheet. I create one sheets for my book. Sometimes I'll take those in. Mm-hmm. I send those to libraries and stuff like that and give it to the person in charge of purchasing. Because really, until you get to that person, even anybody else in the store that's interested in your book mm-hmm. is, you know, they might be interested, but they don't have any sway over whether the store actually orders your book or not. Mm-hmm. And then I go to whatever section my book belongs in and I see who's working there. And if there's a bookseller working there, I give them a copy of my book too and say, hey, I just talked to your purchasing person. I think about buying this book, um, put stock in it. I'd love to give you a copy, let you read it. Same thing. Let me know what you think. My email is inside, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. And I'll usually have an extra copy. Sometimes I'll give the person up front, depending upon how big the bookstore is. And then I ask one of those two people, I say, so who's in charge of your author events? If it's a local bookstore, if it's not local, you probably don't want to do that unless you like traveling for very little return. Right, <laughs> right. But if it's a local bookstore, I say, hey, who's in charge of events? Usually at a, at a certain point, you'll get to know your local bookstore people and who's in mm-hmm. charge of events. Say, hey, I'd be happy to do a signing here. I'd be happy to do something like that. I've even gone as far as one day, which was one of the most fun things I had. I just worked at a bookstore for a day. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'll just work in your mystery department. I mean, I'll have my books there too, but I'll just, I'll just refer people and send them to different books. And if they're Mm -hmm. interested in books in a different department, I know a lot about a lot of books. I'll send Mm -hmm. them to different departments. And I just worked in the bookstore for them for free, basically just gave them my time and just worked there. And then that's a great idea. You know, hey, and by the end of it, a lot of people then know who you are and know your face. And they're like, oh, that's that guy that works at worked at the bookstore that one. (laughs) It's kind of fun. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's some out of the box thinking. That is for sure. That's awesome. So what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Oh, man. Well, so at the very beginning of my writing career, I assumed that I needed a traditional publishing deal Mm -hmm. to really make it, to make a living. I thought I'm going to do this kind of the self-publishing thing on the side and stuff like that and use it to build an audience. Then somebody's going to pick up my books and give me a contract and then I'm going to have made it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Things didn't really 
go that way. I mean, I ended up with some books of publishers too, but I ended up more of a hybrid deal. And I still do because I really evaluate how much control I want over a project. Right. Obviously with control comes responsibility, right? Mm -hmm, so if you mm -hmm. can shuffle something out to a publisher, they're in charge of the cover, the editing, yada, 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 you know, mm -hmm. and then they give you a book and you have to market it, but they take a percentage of that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, or you pay for it all yourself up front and you take responsibility for the editing, the cover, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then you reap the most of the royalties, but you also have the control of this is my book. I don't mm -hmm. like that cover, so I'm going to put this cover on it. Mm -hmm. I don't like that blurb, so I'm going to write my own blurb. You know, that type that type of control that you have. Right, right. So that's how I evaluate those projects as far as being a hybrid author. But I wish I had just known the myth of the traditional publishing deal. And I've got horror stories that people have told me about getting a, a big five deal and then not having the success they were looking for and getting banned from the mm -hmm. big five, just getting mm -hmm. blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and a lot of those people went on to be successful indie authors after right. that, right. because they realized this is a myth. And these mm -hmm. people are really just literally ripping me off. Mm -hmm. Um, and they put me in, a, in an impossible position, and I can never climb out of it. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know I have a lot of friends that are traditionally published. I, I started out traditionally published, and some of my friends are still doing that. And it's almost like you get stuck because you're, especially like I write in mystery, cozies, historical. So that is dependent on a series. And mm -hmm. so if your series is with a traditional publisher, you're kind of, locked in or else you're starting something new and it does get a little, it, it can be difficult to kind of break out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard about some nightmare contracts. Um, so I'm a member of Nink and, and we have kind of a, some chat groups and stuff like that. And there's been a couple publishers, I won't name any names for people have literally signed deals when they were younger authors where those publishers have a lifetime mm -hmm. contract on their book. They basically just own it forever. Mm -hmm. There's, it doesn't expire. So getting your rights back from those publishers is almost impossible. It, it's just an absolute nightmare or where a publisher has first right of refusal on your series, like you were talking about, and they take your series, they take the next book in your series, but it takes them two years to publish it. Mm -hmm. So that whole time you missed out literally on two years of earnings and your mm -hmm. readers are going, why isn't this book, why is this book taking two years to come out? And right. like we were talking about before the show, basically you have no control when you have it with a publisher. So you have to say, it's with my publisher. They're producing mm -hmm. the book. It'll be out when they release it and you right. have no choice. Right. And that really puts you in a difficult position as far as timing releases, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, which are really important for your revenue as right. an author for making right. a living. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I wanted to circle back to the hybrid author thing. So is control the main thing you think of when you make that choice about whether you want to indie publish or hand it off to a publisher? How do you, how do you decide? Oh, that it, it's an evolving thing, but it's primarily control. It's primarily control. I'm more inclined to put a standalone with a publisher and keep a series for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And that's yeah. the part of that reason is that lead time. Mm -hmm. Unless I have four books done and I go here and I give them all to a publisher <laughs> and say, yeah. okay, space these out however you want. Then I just, boom, I'm hands off. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. And I just, you know, work out my other releases in between those or whatever because I have control of that part of my schedule. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is about control. It's about control and responsibility. How much do I want to invest in, you know, the cover for this book, you know, that type of thing? Um, how much do I want to invest of my own time and money to get that accomplished? Right. You know, yeah. and I always feel a little weird when we talk about trad because I am 100% indie, like I am the poster child for indie publishing. I mean, but be, mostly because of a couple of things. One, if you're writing a series and the first one or, you know, the first one does well, second one doesn't do great, then they drop you and you've got two or three other books in that series that you wanted to write, like we were saying. And, then, and if you handed them four books and after the first one, they were like, eh, no thanks or whatever, 
then you're, you've just wasted that time. For me, mm-hmm. I write so slowly that every book I would write for a traditional publisher would be a book I didn't write, get to write for myself. And so mm-hmm. it would be just this long period of time, What basically what you were saying. But if traditional publishing is your dream, then go for it. But do understand there are these there are things that make it not um, fabulous. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like go into it with your eyes open. If you want to traditional publish, if you need that, if that is your dream, then definitely go for it. But just understand that it's not like the key to the pearly gates. I mean, it's it, there, there are issues with it, just like with going indie publishing. Well, I think, and this brings up an interesting point because, and and so I'll tell a quick story that's kind of an aside probably from our main topic, but it's, so, okay. you know, um, but so a lot of writers, especially when you're starting out, one of the things you need is validation, mm-hmm. right? You need validation of two things. First yeah. of all, you need validation that you're a good writer, right? that you're a decent writer, that you have the ability to tell a story in written form in some kind of way that a reader wants to read it. Mm-hmm. So you need that validation. The other validation you need is that your words are worth money. Mm-hmm. Now, fortunately, this what happened with me was I was a freelance writer and I was doing a lot of freelance stuff. And I still do a lot of freelance stuff, although I'm much pickier now about what I actually do mm-hmm. because I can afford to be. But at that time, I couldn't afford to be. I was like, 10 bucks to write your web description? Sure. Why yeah. not? Yeah. You know, that type of thing. But I worked for a museum at the time. We got a, I managed to get us a research contract from the federal government. And I wrote mine site, historical mine site characterization reports for the EPA. And the most important thing, there were, there were several lessons that I learned from that freelance job. The first was these high level people with masters and stuff like that, that work for a government agency don't know how to write. Mm -hmm. And I do, I have a skill and that skill is valuable. Mm -hmm. The second thing about that was it basically taught me that skill is valuable. My words are worth money. I give them a report and they give me a giant check Mm -hmm. and they don't care how long it took me. They don't care what method I use. They don't care anything about that. They just care that they have that report in hand because they need it to go forward with a project. And so that those lessons I think are invaluable and whatever way you can find to learn them as a young writer, just understand you're a good writer Mm -hmm. and your words are worth money. If you can understand those two things, you'll be partly on your way to success. I'm not going to tell you that solves imposter syndrome because that would be a lie, but Mm -hmm. it, it, it will help. It would help you along the way if you can have some success. Right. Right. I agree. Speaking of lessons learned and mistakes made, we like to talk mm-hmm. about those on the podcast so that we can all learn from each other's mistakes. So, ha, but have you ever had a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Um, yeah, yes, 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 and no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it depends on what, what you mean by turn out to be a good thing. Because I have some mistakes that I've learned lessons from. And then I've had some things that, you know, they weren't necessarily a mistake, but there was like, I don't know if this is going to work mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. And um, it ended up working out just fine, mm-hmm. you know, that yeah. type of thing. Um, so I think it's kind of a mixed bag, but I've, I've had some successful things that you might call mistakes at the beginning. I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to write this book, but I'm just going to give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you another story <laughs> because why not? Um, so if you, if you look me up on Amazon, you will see that I have written one erotica title. Mm. I was working for a publisher at the time. And I was actually, I was, a, I, I worked as an acquisitions editor, then a regular editor. Um, and then I took over as a managing editor for the series because nobody else wanted to do it. And the series was called City Nights, and it was a series of, I, I wouldn't even call it erotica, I'd call it steamy romance mm-hmm. type novels. And so I agreed to write the first one as an example. This is really what we're looking for is this is a novella. It's this length. It has these elements to it. This is what we want. We want not pure erotica. We want story mm-hmm. with it. We also want it in a specific place. So people are introduced to a specific place. So I live in Boise. Mine was 
One Night in Boise. That's the first in the City Night series. And I've sold a lot of copies of that book. Um, and it's really, I mean, that was a number of years ago now, probably eight, that's probably eight years old, seven or eight mm-hmm, years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and it still continues to sell. It's with a publisher, you know, it's a novella, so it's just digital. Um, yeah. I just tell people you're welcome to go read that erotic if you want, but then if you're friends with me, you can't come up to me and go, Oh, really? Yeah, that's, exactly. just not, oh. <laughs> that's just not cool. But um, it was a it was a thing that I was like, I don't know if writing outside this far outside my genre is a good idea. Well, I wrote it, and what it ended up being was there's a mystery element to my erotic erotic (laughs) novel. There's a detective and his wife. There's a murder. There's a solution to the crime. I'm like, um, so I basically just wrote a mystery with erotic elements on top of it and, and called it steamy romance. And there it is. So um, it was, it was interesting. It was fun. I actually learned a lot about the genre. So when I edited future books, I was, I was a lot more in touch with what was happening and what reader Mm -hmm. expectations were and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was, it, I mean, it wasn't really a mistake necessarily, but it was a stretch outside of the genre. And I, but I did it anyway. And it turned out it's not, I mean, it wasn't a bad thing at all. That's great. That's great. So what about the opposite? What about something you thought this is the best thing I've ever done or home run. And it turned out to not do what you thought it would do. Oh man, this is a tough one because it's still it's it's um it's a series that I'll be wrapping up soon. But I started a series um with another author. He he's an older gentleman. Um, and we started a series of mystery novellas, um, which then we were putting in compilations and stuff like that. And they're actually a lot of fun to read, but they're just not as successful as I would like them to be. And part of that mm-hmm. is because because there's two people writing in the series, the voice varies from book to book. And then unfortunately he had some issues with his family and his wife's health and had to drop out of the series, which left me holding this series. It's called the capital city murder series. Obviously if I'm going to do every capital city in the U S there are 50 novellas and it's something that I can't do myself and still manage all the rest of the things that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, So I've had to slow down the pace of it significantly and stuff like that um, to make the books, the novellas better and things like that as we go along. So the novellas are getting better um, and they're getting longer. So I think the next one's actually going to be a full length novel because I can't help myself. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and since I'm more in control of the series myself, then it doesn't have to follow that exact same format. Um, but that's one that I wish that there had been, that we had done some more research and laid some more groundwork before we started that series. Mm-hmm. Now the marketing of it is a, it's a constant struggle mm-hmm. because we didn't have an, you know, as much of an audience in mind as we probably should have. Right. So, right. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. it the audience for the the shorter novels? That, That's part or, I mean, of novellas? it. Yeah. Part of it is it's hard to run ads to novellas. Yeah. You can only price a novella so high. Mm-hmm. So you can only bid so high for ads. Right. So um, what I have had success doing with that is you can run BookBub ads to series pages. Right. So I've run BookBub ads to the actual series page and then have people buy the series all at one stroke. And then that actually works out really well. And we have all of them out on audiobook, which has helped mm-hmm. tremendously as well. Um, I mean, it's it hasn't been the greatest for ROI, but it has been a help in sales because we have formats, all kinds of formats to market. Yeah. So that does help. That's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I think I was going to say that's interesting because, you know, everybody talks about audio and how it has to be long to be successful. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's great. Do y'all bundle them together or people? We do. Them? We do bundle them. So because we were recording them anyway, We have all the individual books on Audible, and then we have compilations of every five books are pulled together. And those are monstrous. Those are like 10, 11 hours of audio in a single audio. I think the last one is actually close to 12. Um, So it's a lot of audio in one volume. And so it's easier to get someone to use one of their Audible credits as far as Audible subscribers mm-hmm. already. But it's kind of, we can get people into the the initial audio books if it's their first Audible or whatever. It's the first right. thing that they're doing. Yeah. So Okay. That's yeah. good to know. That's interesting. So we talked a little bit about different uh, mindset shifts you've had to make, but what do you think is the biggest change in mind, in your thinking that you've had to make 
over your author career? You know, I knew at the beginning of my author career that this was a business. Um, so I, I knew it was a business, but I didn't know, and this is going to sound weird. I knew it was a business, but I didn't know it was so much of a job. <laughs> you know, my yeah. freelance writing was a job and I understood that, but I didn't understand fully how much, like I talk to people about writer's block and stuff like that sometimes. And, and I say, really, it's difficult for me to allow myself to have writer's block for any length of time because my living depends on this. So it's like if you are a waiter or a doctor and you show up and, well, I'm a doctor, but sorry, I have surgery block today and I can't do your procedure. Well, then you go home, right? <laughs> I mean, and you don't get paid, right? So, and they find somebody else to do your job eventually. And so I didn't realize how much of a job that this actually is that a lot of times it's just a matter of sitting down training your muse to show up as much mm -hmm. as that is possible and just doing the work and then also the marketing work that goes with it right. and just understanding this is nearly a full-time job just doing your books it's it's nearly mm -hmm. a full-time job and you have to do it you just have to show up and do it mm -hmm. because nobody's going to do it for you you take a few days off you come back to your office and everything's exactly the same no yeah. temp came in and cleaned things up for you or did things for you, you know? So uh, that it, it's somebody a definite, would do my bookkeeping, right? You know, like, yeah, it's a definite shift that, in yeah. mindset. Well, and you can pay people to do certain things. You can outsource right. certain things in your author career, but everything you outsource that you're paying for eats into your return on investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to evaluate, you know, and I try to evaluate it by would I be better off writing? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so if I go, well, maybe I could resurrect that old series and do this ad campaign and do this and do that. But would I be better off writing the next book? Right. And yeah. if the answer is yes, then I write the next book. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I start writing yeah. the next book. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's an interesting um, pressure that like if you're in a creative industry and you have to be creative kind of on demand or continually, then it brings an interesting uh, stress to it. I think that maybe like, like if you're a surgeon or a plumber or whatever, you know what your job is and you just have to go do it and you have to deal with the daily grind. But then when you're a writer, you also have that daily grind, but it involves creativity. And I think that is where a lot of people kind of get stuck. And I think you have to figure out like, what is it that helps you be creative that helps you get over that being stuck feeling, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it can take a while to figure that out, you know, yeah, if, you're, you if, you're, to, if you're not used to just, if you're able to write whenever you want, and then you write when you don't want, and then you have to write, it's a whole different ball game. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you have to nurture that creative side of you. And so you have to determine what that looks like for you. If that means going for a walk mm -hmm. every day or whenever you get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, we were just talking the other day about, um, one of the guys that, um, uh, well, Douglas Adams used to take baths. And I mean, he must have had an incredibly huge bathtub um, because he was a really tall guy. Um, yeah. And he, he took like sometimes five or six baths a day because that's where he would think. Um, wow. There was another writer we were talking about. I can't remember his name right now, but he would take like eight showers a day because it, <laughs> shower was his thinking time. Uh -huh. And so he figured out, well, if I need to think, I need to go in the shower. And so he would just get up from his writing, go take a shower. So sometimes he would take, you know, eight showers a day. And so I'm like, you know, <laughs> the side effect of being a great writer is dry and chafed skin. I was going to you know, I mean, lots like, of lotion. If that's and I'm like, lotion. I need a bigger bathtub if I'm going to be like Douglas Adams. So you just yeah. need to figure out what it is that works for you. And it's not the same for everybody, you know, right. uh, whatever, but whatever that is for you, you need to figure out how that is that you, that you nurture your creativity and give it a chance to work the way it should. And then I use mental tricks. I only in Word, Microsoft Word, I only edit and write nonfiction in Word. I write all my fiction in Scrivener. Hmm. And the reason is when I open Scrivener, my brain knows we're doing creative writing right now. We're not editing. We're not doing tech writing. We're not doing nonfiction. We're doing we're writing. That's what we're doing right now. Um, and so it's a, it's kind of a mental trick for your brain. Also, you can do that with a place. 
you show up at a certain place. I have people that they have a different desktop on their computer for when they're writing, you know, whatever yeah. the case may be, whatever mental trick you have that keeps your muse engaged, use it, Yeah, use it. And yeah. it, it may take you a bit to figure it out and figure out like what time of the day is your best writing time of the day. Try different ones and see, see what works. When I first started out, I had kids at home, little kids at home. Thankfully, they're all gone now, but I had little kids at home. And so I would get up at 4.30 in the morning and from 4.30 to 7, I would write. Now, was that always the greatest time in the world to be up? No, but it was quiet and there was no way my kids were going to get up at 4.30 in the morning. If I stayed up late, they might stay up late or try to sneak out of the room late or something like that. But 4.30 in the morning... You couldn't yeah. wake those kids with a bomb. It was <laughs> yeah. fantastic for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So That's yeah. usually a quiet time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Some work done. So, yeah. And I think you're right. You have to figure out what works for you. And it may take a little while to um, kind of figure that out. But yeah. speaking of figuring things out, you've been working with interviewing writers for Plotter. And so we wanted mm-hmm. to talk to you about Plotter. And yeah, uh, can, I give, can you give us just, for people who aren't familiar, just a little kind of overview of what it is. And then we would love to hear if you have um, any takeaways because you've done a lot of interviews with authors. So any wisdom that you picked up from authors? Oh my goodness. I could go on for a long time about that. And so first I'll introduce (laughs) you to Plotter. So Plotter is a visual outlining software uh, for writers. It's like, it's hard to describe because it's kind of like a cork board only way better. And there's all kinds of other features that you can use and places to develop your characters and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there, there's all kinds of things you can do with Plotter, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's a great program. We have all kinds of demos. I'll just tell you, you know, go to plotter.com and check it out. Um, and then you can also check out Thursdays with Troy, which is an interview and um, kind of plotting series on Thursdays. There's a lot of them on YouTube. If you join Plotter, you can watch them live in our YouTube, in our um, Facebook group as well. Um, but the main takeaway that I have from interviewing tons of authors, and I kind of knew this from being from hanging out with authors. When I first started out, I was very rigid in my ideas of how you needed to do things. You need to write every day. You need to do this. You need to do that, right? Um, and people would say, I don't have to write every day. And I'm like, well, that's very nice for you. But, you know, I would kind of poo-poo it, you know, or poo-poo um, writer's block or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I found by interviewing authors is, first of all, they bring their creativity to the planning process as much as they do the actual writing of the book process. And everybody does different things. Everybody does something different. And there's not really a wrong answer. I've just had some light bulbs go on different times when I'm talking to writers. I'm like, there is something I never would have thought of, but it's brilliant at the same time. It's absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing that I've learned is we talk about story templates and story structure a lot in that series. So if you go watch it, you're going to see that a lot. Um, And I found that story structures are all very similar. They're usually (laughs) three or four act structure. A four act structure is really just act two broken into two parts. Yes. And they have a very similar number of elements and arcs. The primary difference between the two is the way you as a writer thinks. So because one of them works for me has no bearing on whether it'll work for you or not. So people are like, Oh, the hero's journey, save the cat. This is the, Mm -hmm. this is the thing everybody should use. And I'm like, actually, That is the wrong answer. What everybody (laughs) should use is what works for you, what you're comfortable with. And so that's that's one of my biggest takeaways is that Mm -hmm. there's just there's not a wrong way of doing things. Yeah. Pretty much just your way. Yeah. And that's cool about plotters that there are so many, y'all have a lot of templates in there, and they're all unique and have their own kind of twist on it. But it, it it does show how many different ways there are to do things. So yeah, you can make your own and I've created one and you can find it. If you go to YouTube and look up the one of the first YouTube videos we did was about the sleuth's journey, which is mm-hmm. a mystery template I developed by modifying the hero's journey for mysteries. Yeah. There's nothing unique or special about that beyond that, that I modified it in a way that works for me that 
works for mysteries and it just adapted the hero's journey. So mm-hmm. you can make your own, you can do your own thing, whatever it is. Um, and people use that software. So it's basically like a linear planning software. So they use it for everything. I have my rolling writing schedule in Plotter. Mm-hmm. People have their 2021 goals. Some people use it yeah. for meal planning. I've seen people do all <laughs> kinds of weird, wacky stuff with it that I would have never thought of, uh-huh. but it works. So I'm like, you get the beauty of different software and tools like that is you can use whatever you want in whatever way you need that works for you. And you don't have to follow somebody else's lead, but every now and then you get great ideas from somebody else that will just spark something in you. Um, and that whole collaboration and community thing is a really big deal. Yeah. 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 It's very cool. Yeah. But we also wanted to talk to you about um, stand up comedy. So I saw on your website that you do that. Does that help you with your writing or is that just something that you do on the side for fun? Well, so I primarily do it on the side for fun, but so, so the way it really started was I'm, I'm terrible with puns. Like I, I <laughs> drop puns everywhere. And my wife just gets to the point where she almost ignores it. I'm like, is your hearing going? She's like, no, no, I heard it. Just not even going to acknowledge that. And so they had this thing called the Idaho pun slam. Um, oh. that the, this person I knew put together and said, Hey, basically you come in and the way it works is very much like improv writing. You get a prompt at the Mm -hmm. beginning of it, and you get like 10 minutes to prepare two minutes of material. You've got a two-minute time limit. You get two minutes of material with puns on whatever topic they hand you when you arrive, right? And so then you get up, you perform your two minutes of puns. And then at the intermission of the show, there's usually about 10 people in the show. And then the intermission of the show, you go out and you get another topic, and you've only got the time of the intermission to prepare for your second set. And then the ending of the show is that whoever is the top two from that particular night, you kind of have a pun off. You get a topic <laughs> and you get like a minute or so to decide what you're going to do. And then you just go back and forth with different puns. Um, so the first one of those that I did, I mean, the, my first set was all right. But my second set, I had finally figured out like, oh, this is how this works. This is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the, then the second time that I went and did it, my first topic was grammar and punctuation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Which worked out perfectly. And in fact, you can get, they have a pot, they do it as a podcast too. So you can go to idahopunslam.com. And if you look at September 24th, you can listen to me do, you can listen to the whole thing. Um, oh, that's funny. And I'm and, sure. And uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a blast. And then the second topic that I got was in the grocery store. Well, I've worked in a grocery store when I was in college. Yeah. So to me, I was like, oh, well, this is just life. Mm -hmm. I'm just making up puns about my life, which I do all the time anyway. And um, it was actually a blast. And I got to the finals on that one, which means that I'm into the actuals, which means I'm into a semifinal that happens in December where there's real money on the line. So um, I've decided I need to read up and actually maybe work on this pun thing a little bit. Um, And there's another one this coming Saturday. So I'm going to go do that too. So it's it's more something I do on the side, but I think it's a great outlet for my for my creativity. Mm -hmm. And I think having other outlets, there's a lot of writers I know that are musicians or which I would love to be a musician, but I can't play any instruments and I can't carry a tune. Um, Mm -hmm. So there is that minor (laughs) obstacle. Um, But if you have a creative outlet other than writing, I think it's really good for your muse to just give yourself a break and go paint a picture, go photograph stuff, go whatever hobby it is that you have that's apart from writing, but that's also creative. I think Mm -hmm. that creates some real opportunities for you. And it gives your muse a chance to recharge on something that's not work. It's not what what you're, what you're writing all the time and what you have to work out. Yeah. So I looked it up. One of my favorite uh, quotes from Churchill is about a pun. It says, um, a joke is a very serious thing. And he has a very, uh, another one, I can't think of the one about puns, but anyway, so yes. And I think that's interesting that like that a pun is so short and so punchy. And so it's probably a nice change from like a long manuscript. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's really fun. And also the other thing that's fun about doing something like stand up comedy or music or whatever it is that you do is you get an immediate reaction from the audience. Mm-hmm. So you can, you can immediately know well, a lot of times when you're writing, you don't know, even when you send it off to beta readers and stuff like that, you're like, maybe they're just being nice. And, <laughs> you know, you don't know until you actually put something out into the world, whether people like it or love it or not, that type of thing. And with it, with an audience, a live audience, you get an immediate response. I like to do poetry slams and stuff like that sometimes as well, for the exact same reason, 
you get in a, a reaction to your poetry. My poetry, it's funny that I do stand-up comedy and my poetry <laughs> tends to usually be pretty dark. <laughs> when I write poetry, it's when I'm in a dark place or I'm writing about a dark subject and I just really yeah. need to get some emotion out about it. And I write a poem about it. Um, and so, you know, when I do poetry, it's not funny at all. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm. You know, I do. I like to do um, stand up comedy and pun slams and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so it's a completely different thing, but it, it's the mm-hmm. same thing. You get a reaction from the audience. You can tell whether you're emotionally reaching them or not. Right. And I think that's a it's nice. It's a nice feedback that because that's immediate. So yeah. something writers don't get a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I can see how that could be. That could be nice. So, yeah. Well, what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success? Um, I think the best thing, man, I, so, okay. So I'll, I'll limit it to two things. Let's put it that way. I think the first thing as a writer to um, set yourself up for success is learn to take criticism and feedback and learn that, I I just put it to people this way. You can be as artsy as you want about your book when you're in the process of writing and creating it. That's fantastic. And you can do that all you want. Once you've written the end, it's now a product that you need to get in shape for the market to sell. And you need to divorce yourself from your work and look at it that way. 90% of the time when your editor sends you back edits, you should just approve all of them and move on with your life. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and move on to writing the next book. I understand that that's hard. And I, I don't mean do blanket approvals. I mean, you need to read through them. You know, your editor can make mistakes mm-hmm. too. They're human. So, so read through them. Yes. But for the most part, you should just approve their changes and move on because they're on your side. They're <laughs> trying to make your book better. They really are. And so if you can just accept that part of the process and accept that criticism and move on, people do this all the time. It it really helps to do freelance writing too, because you get a lot of feedback. That's just like, we want to change this. And and the more you can just say, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The easier your life will be. It's just, that's one of the other things. And the other thing I think is just that understanding of what defines success for you. Right. Don't compare your success to someone else's. If you're comparing yourself to Stephen King or J.K. Rowling, you're going to spend a lot of your writing time really disappointed. Um, Be happy for those around you who find more success than you do. Mm -hmm. Because all ships rise on an incoming tide. You, there, there is no competition. You're not in competition with that other mystery author. That's not your competition, your colleagues. You're both working in the same industry and towards the same goals. And the more you can realize those things, the easier success will come and the happier your life will be. This will take care of a lot of your, a lot of your anxiety and a lot of those things. It won't take care of all of it, but it'll take care Mm -hmm. of some of it. As I said, imposter syndrome is a real thing. And Mm -hmm. um, there, there will be hard times in your life. And, and that could be a whole nother hour <laughs> oh, yeah. um, of, yeah. of talking through those particular things, right? But so we don't want to dwell on those things, but we just want to say, define your terms of success and then always look back on what you've accomplished so far mm-hmm. and understand how successful you are and how far you've come. Stop looking at how far you need to go. Yeah. Well, Excellent note to end on. I won't try to add anything to that because that's great advice. So where can people find out more about you? Um, So my website, uh, TroyLambertWrites.com. I also tell people I joke about this because I teach about SEO a lot. I'm like, Google me. If you can't find me, you're probably not trying or you're spelling my name wrong. (laughs) Um, So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is which is also always possible. You can check me on Facebook. Facebook and Twitter are probably the most active. I do have an Instagram presence. Most of that is pictures of my dog. Um, so if you follow German Shepherd <laughs> hashtags on LinkedIn, you've probably seen my dog McLean. Um, he he's more popular than I am visually. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that always is right. Dogs and cats are always the winners. <laughs> yeah, and if you if you go to my website um, on pretty much any page, there's a thing where you can subscribe to my newsletter. You get a free book when you do that. Um, and I'm adding some stuff to that coming up in the first of the year, so um, that's kind of exciting too. Okay, well, great. Well, we will have all those links in the show notes, and they will be at wish I'd known them podcast.com. And we wanted to say thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you.
All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.